Hi, I'm Bill Rapisi, Executive Director of Lymphatic Education and Research Network, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for joining us today for our symposium series. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of you who have become members of LEARN and help support this series so that we can continue bringing this kind of groundbreaking information uh, to you in your homes and offices. Uh, I would also suggest for all of you who have not become members of LEARN, $5 a month, you can become a member of LEARN and help support this programming and the research that we do. Thanks very much for joining us and I look forward to having you become a member. Well, hello, lymphatic community. Uh, thank you to LEARN for this opportunity to talk about a way to see through your skin to visualize lymphatics. Uh, here we go with a few disc disclosures concerning myself and my colleagues. The human uh, near-infrared fluorescence imaging studies presented here were conducted under IRB approvals and FDA phase uh, 0, 1, and 2 IND approvals as combinational device drug uh, uh, studies. And clinical studies were funded by the Longenberger Foundation uh, funneled through the American Cancer Society, Tactile uh, in Incorporated, Lymphopress, Migo AFAC, and the National Institutes of Health um, with the grant uh, mechanisms you see listed here. InDesign and Green use is off-label and uh, members of the UT Health Center for Molecular Imaging do have financial interest uh, including royalty as well as equity uh, in a UT Health startup company. Okay, so now we get to start. Light is made of uh, different wavelengths of electromagnetic energy, such as ultraviolet and visible. Uh, wavelengths in the near-infrared range, which is at the high end of the range uh, we, can, we can ordinarily see, and a little bit beyond. Well, these wavelengths are special. These near-infrared uh, uh, light waves are not blocked by molecules that make up living tissue, such as water or hemoglobin protein or melanin in your skin. Instead, near-infrared light penetrates tissue. Uh, you can put a flashlight beam, let's see if this this will work. You can put a flashlight beam uh, up against your, your, your hand and you can see the red glow through the, the uh, tissue there and that's not uh, coloration due to blood. This is actually near-infrared light that is penetrating all the way through uh, tissue. Near-infrared fluorescence lymphatic imaging, and I'll call it NERFLY from now on, is an imaging method that takes advantage of this light property to show us uh, lymphatic, lymphatic vessels uh, and how they are pumping or maybe not pumping. The method starts with tiny injections into your skin of microdoses. <laughs> this just won't go. I've never... There we go. Yeah, it's just slow. Here we go. Uh, tiny injections of microdoses of a fluorescent dye that glows in the near infrared range. The injections are similar to those that you get for allergy skin testing, and we can use a numbing spray for to minimize discomfort. The dye is called Indocyanin and Green, and um, or ICG for short, and it latches onto proteins in lymph fluid preferentially, such as albumin, and moves with the fluid and the proteins through primary lymphatic uh, uh, vessels to larger vessels and lymph nodes. Uh, with an earthly we shine a dim laser diode uh, or laser uh, <clears throat> onto a patch of skin and the uh, near infrared light from the laser easily penetrates the, the tissue, uh, it excites the dye molecules in the lymph and then those dye molecules that are excited uh, spit out uh, light photons that are that come back up through the skin and are picked up by a specialized camera system that then converts these uh, photons into images and movies of lymph architecture and pulsing. Uh, we uh, watch lymph pulsing, if this will change, hey, here we go, uh, for a few hours, usually one to two is, is all that's necessary, while the study subject is, is supine. And, and here you can see a demonstration by Dr. Carolyn Fife, who has collaborated with us on many Nerfly projects. Here we're gonna have, hopefully, a movie that won't shut down, yay! Uh, healthy lymphatics in a, an arm in a Nerfly movie. 
the vessels appear as these green linear slowly pulsing structures. You can see what appear to be packets of lymph or bulges of dye in the vessels uh, where lymph is accumulating behind lymph uh, uh, behind the valves in the, in the vessels. And every so often uh, a valve will open and it will allow the accumulated lymph to move along to the next valve, sort of like floodgates. Um, so you, you, you're actually seeing lymph angion to lymph angion movement. The process is slow even in a healthy arm. On average, lymphatic uh, vessels pulse about once a minute, and, and this movie is playing at faster than normal speed. And while a blood circulation system is pumped by your heart, the lymphatic system, of course, depends on muscle contraction and nitric oxide fluctuations and other factors that encourage lymph to move. Oh, here we go. Okay, this example of lymph pulsing through um, healthy lower legs shows you the convergence of vessels coming up from the feet to join with calf vessels in the, um, at, at the ventromedial bundles. Well, as an imaging method, where does Nerfly fit in with, uh, for, for visualizing lymphatics? Well, Nerfly, in the form that I've just showed you, is in commercial development. It's not widely available yet. Another imaging modality that may sound more familiar is lymphoscintigraphy, and it's commonly used to detect gross uh, abnormalities with lymph movement and uh, to identify sentinel lymph nodes in cancer patients. And this method is great for detecting problems with large, deep lymphatic vessels and is available in many clinical settings. Lymphoskinograms, however, are a bit grainy. Um, they can't show lymph pumping in real time and, and sometimes if uh, they can't provide an explanation for swelling if, for example, they're just uh, are, are small or fine lymphatic vessels that are malfunctioning. MRI can, of course, be seen, be used to see uh, lymphatic vessel anatomy in fine detail, but usually requires contrast media injection. MRI is great for detecting enlarged lymph nodes. It has been used to calculate lymph velocity, but it, again, it can't show lymph pumping in real time. There are other imaging systems that use endocyne and greener, ICG, and near-infrared near detection. Two systems are used by surgeons to determine blood flow and perfusion during surgery. Another system is used to mark uh, lymphatic vessels before microvascular surgeons cut through skin to perform lymphatic surgeries. And while these other systems are useful for specific applications, none allow visualiz visualization of lymph pumping in real time. The uh, Penetration of a uh, limit of Nerfly has been shown to be three to four centimeters, but Nerfly uh, may not show the deep large vessels if vessels close to the skin surface are fluorescing. Nerfly is particularly useful for visualizing fine lymphatic vessel anatomy, determining lymph rooting, and where there's a need to, to see if lymph is pumping in real time. So you can see how Nerfly fits in the toolbox with other lymphatic imaging methods. And of note, we also have Nerfly imaging systems for mice and rats, and this allows a, cl a kind of a, a, a collaboration of, of mouse or a laboratory animal and human studies so that we can confirm genetic contributions of lymphatic dysfunction uh, using, say, knockout mice and, and, and correlate that to similar mutations that are found in humans. And I'll, I'll provide an example of that in a, in a minute. And another imaging modality such as MRI or lymphoscintigraphy maybe aren't uh, readily adaptable to lab animals. So this feature of this human to mouse uh, comparison is, is unique to Nerfly. My mentor Eva Sebek and my colleague John Rasmussen developed Nerfly using night vision technology and they moved the method out of the engineering lab and into the clinic. Nerfly has now been used to make um, exciting discoveries about how lymph moves or, or doesn't move what lymphatic vessel anatomy looks like in lymphedema, or LE, and even whether lymphedema treatments can really work to move lymph. Uh, note that I will hereafter refer to lymphedema as LE. Before moving along though, I would like to address a couple of common questions that arise when Nerfly is discussed. If you can bear through this um, with um, me first, we'll get to the studies. So first, there's always a question, is ICG safe to use for lymphatic imaging? Well, the dye has been used for over 50 years safely and at 300 to 400 times higher doses for other types of imaging, such as liver clearance, cardiovascular function, testing, and retinal angiography based on its dark green color. 
And we have used ICG in over 350 study subjects, including babies and children, with no adverse effects. And researchers in Japan, Belgium, and other, other countries have used higher amounts of ICG in large numbers of study subjects with no adverse effects. ICG does not have any uh, known metabolites. It has a half-life of three to five minutes in blood, and it's quickly extracted uh, by the, the liver um, in, into to bile. So 15 years ago, though, reports of ICG effects on retinal eye cells were investigated by a number of research groups, and ICG was found to affect cultured uh, uh, eye retinal cells, this is in vitro, but only at levels of dye that are more than 20 times what we use for lymphatic imaging. Um, in these studies of retinal eye cells, factors such as the amount of salt in the ICG dilution solution, the amount of iodide in the ICG preparation, of course the dose of ICG, the, and the strength of illuminating light were all shown to determine whether or not ICG affects retinal eye cells. And of note, the ICG used in these retinal cell studies were, it was it's diluted in water, not in saline bound to albumin, which is the form of ICG used in Nerfly. The type of cell to matters. There were studies of corneal cells um, that found no effects of ICG. The dose of ICG needed to kill cells, uh, for example, myocardial or heart cells, has been determined, and the dose is 10,000 times more than the dose used in Nerfly. So, so that's enough for the dye itself. And another question comes up, does illuminating ICG with laser light cause free radical effects that could harm cells? Well, reactive oxygen species, such, uh, also known as free radicals, occur normally in processes such as photosynthesis and neutrophil, bacterial killing, and there are many antioxidants like carotenoids, for example, that are naturally present in cells to prevent cell damage by these reactive oxygen species. Now, if the levels become too high, tissue damage can occur. And ICG, if it energetically reaches something called a triplet state, uh, can produce reactive oxygen species. But the laser power needed to produce this triplet state in ICG is over a thousand times more than what we use in Nerfly. And in the experiment shown uh, previously for this triplet state thing, the ICG solvent solution was very different from what we use in Nerfly. There have been no studies published describing whether uh, or how long ICG stays in human lymphatics after imaging. Although we have um, observed complete clearance after anywhere from two to four hours in mice and rats, and microvascular surgeons have, um, one has told me that after they inject ICG, they don't see it in the lymphatic vessels after about an hour uh, after injecting the dye. So uh, we don't know how long it lasts in lymphatics, but it doesn't appear to last more than a few hours. Once ICG moves from lymphatics to join blood vasculature through the thoracic duct, then the very rapid clearance occurs through the, through the liver and, and bile. So that's three to five minutes half-life. So worldwide, hundreds of people have, have participated in studies using ICG and lymphatic imaging with no reported adverse effects. And based on our, and our group and other groups' experience with, experience with the ICG and lymphatics, it appears that lymphatic imaging with the dye is very safe. And, and uh, here's another question that comes up. When we see lymph pulsing with Nerfly, are we seeing free ICG dye flowing through lymphatic vessels, or are we seeing ICG that's bound to albumin and other lymph proteins? And the answer is we're seeing ICG that's bound to uh, albumin and other proteins. Um, Dr. Cynthia Davies Finn showed that ICG binds to albumin preferentially in a, in a 2010 research paper. And in its unbound state, ICG is only weakly fluorescent, um, but upon binding to protein, its fluorescence intensity is greatly enhanced. And uh, you have to consider, too, that albumin as a large protein, once ICG binds to it, this, this um, uh, size limitation effectively confines the dye bound to protein to the vascular compartments. You know, free ICG would just, just leak out. So I'm going to show you a slide uh, of uh, just a, a simple experiment, and, and it just shows where I, I took equal numbers of ICG and um, mixed it with equal numbers of, of uh, uh, equal numbers of albumin molecules in a saline solution similar in osmol osmolality to human blood. And after I mixed the molecules, I put them into this special tube here. And this special tube has a filter here that holds large molecules like albumin up in this compartment that you see here. 
And um, as a control, I, I, I took an, another tube and just put free ICG in there, no, no albumin. Then I uh, just simply centrifuged this, the uh, tubes and then took a fluorescent picture of them. And you can see here in this image that in the tube that just had free ICG down at the bottom, you don't see any fluorescent. That's because ICG by itself is very, very dim. You see a little fluorescence up here in the filter, which is autofluorescence in a tube. I, I could, could show you a tube that had nothing in it and you would see the same thing. But in the tube that had albumin and it was allowed to bind to ICG, all of it stayed up here in the, um, the, uh, the top compartment and you can see that it's brightly fluorescent. So. Yes, when you see Nerfly uh, uh, green uh, dye moving, it's actually large proteins such as albumin bound to ICG. So, with those two points discussed out of the way, now for the fun, I'll just get to describe the spectrum of applications for Nerfly and what we've learned about lymphatics along the way. Um, uh, we did a large Nerfly study of LE combining the use of Nerfly to study lymphatic vessel anatomy and pumping together with genetic sequencing to identify genes that may cause primary LE or a susceptibility to secondary LE, say after cancer treatment. Nerfly was used to, to, to phenotype the study subjects to show whether lymph anatomy and pumping were abnormal and for the genotyping we gathered DNA from family members of LE study subjects to investigate the possible genetic contribution. So doctors uh, Carolyn Fife, Eric Mouse, Letitia Smith, and Rie Guillaud all collaborated with our team and several previously unidentified LE associated genetic mutations were discovered. Interestingly of all the mutations found, one affected gene um, product normally forms a glue that, that holds lymphatic valve cells together. And interestingly, this mutation in the uh, valve glue molecule um, lies in a gene that's also associated with spina bifida, which is a disorder in which the neural tube closes in completely during gestation. In a family with this mutation, numerous LE cases occurred, as well as one of spina bifida that we learned of after we'd done the study. Of note, LE is 100 times more prevalent in the spina bifida population versus the normal population. Uh, in another family, we found that two gene mutations had to work in tandem to cause LE. And, and again, I mentioned earlier, the Nerfly devices that image lymphatics in laboratory rats and mice allow confirmation of these uh, Nerfly uh, human uh, genetic and imaging uh, correlations. Indeed, in each of the mutations found, and I have the papers listed here, um, in each of the mutations found in human LA subjects, uh, they also created similar lymphatic abnormalities in experimental mice. And our sequencing guru, Dr. Manuel uh, gonzalez Garay, as well as Dr. Jermaine uh, Igoa, worked as team members on these genetic projects. Dr. Patricia Burroughs, who is an interventional pediatric radiologist previously with UT Health and, and now at uh, Medical College of Wisconsin, collaborated on a Nerfly imaging study of a Parks Weber syndrome study subject. And this syndrome is marked by port wine stains and an overgrown limb. The Nerfly image <coughs> imaging revealed aberrant lymphatic vessels in both the affected and unaffected legs. <coughs> and a, gen a genetic mutation in the RASA1 gene correlated with RASA1 mutations in mice. I'll show you the movie here. Um, you can see uh, Kyla's um, uh, lymph here, you can see the cities there. And um, these mice also uh, displayed the similar overgrown lymphatics. And, and Dr. Philip King of the University of Michigan Medical School collaborated on the genetics and the animal model side of this study. We've looked at a number of breast cancer related lymphedema uh, or LE subjects. And when we examined Nerfly images of lymphatic architecture in these women, we found that even on unaffected arms, lymphatic vessels were abnormal in many cases. And what's more, the, ab the lymphatic abnormalities increased with time since LA onset. And these, these findings suggest that LA is uh, a systemic progressive disease. And here you can see healthy lymphatics where the nice linear vessels uh, and lymph nodes are, are evident, including axillary nodes here and some cubital ones here. Um, in the breast cancer related lymphedema study subjects, we would see non-moving dye. And here you can see some black tape we had to put over the injection sites because the camera is so sensitive, it'll, it'll, we have saturation issues if we don't. But here's some tortuous, twisty vessels, maybe some rerouting, uh, recruitment of other vessels to get lymph 
uh, moving when they can, and then even punctate spots that might represent protein clumped together with the dye and just sitting there. And so we saw um, a lot of different uh, aberrations in the, in the lymphedema population there. And I'm now working on a longitudinal study of breast cancer related LE uh, with MD Anderson Cancer Center radiation oncologist Dr. Simona Shadelman to chronicle changes in lymphatic vessel architecture and function as LE develops, and as well as to investigate immune factors that may contribute to LE. We also intend to determine whether uh, NERFLE can detect lymphatic abnormalities at the very, very earliest stages of LE. And here you can see stagnant lymph here in this green area here, and a, a breast cancer survivor not yet diagnosed with LE, but complaining of heaviness in his hand. And we know uh, papers by Nicole Stout, uh, Gergich, and others have shown that the earlier lymph LE is uh, detected and treated, the better the outcomes. Working with uh, Dr. Karen Erbst, of, uh, now of the University of Arizona, we found that several adipose tissue disorders are associated with lymphatic dysfunction. And we all know that lymph sends molecular signals to adipose cells, telling them to multiply and grow in size. Well, um, Nerfly showed that two rare inherited disorders, uh, Magdalene's and Durkheim's diseases, uh, present with dilated and, and sometimes twisty, tortuous lymphatic vessels that's, that still pump. And here I'm, I'm using these, these figures just to show where the adipose tissue distributes typically in these diseases. And there's a paper that uh, uh, was published on the Durkheim's uh, subject. And uh, lipedema, another adipose disorder, which seems to affect uh, approximately 11% of women in the U.S., and I know that's 14 to 17 million. Uh, lymphatic vessel architecture has appeared normal, but lymph pumping seems to be sluggish. And you can see the typical uh, adipose tissue distribution um, here. In uh, answer to an appeal for compassionate use of Nerfly to help identify draining lymphatic roots in a head and neck cancer survivor who was experiencing, he was experiencing severe LE, uh, our group found that lymphatic vessels could regenerate across scar lines. You can see he has a number of scars here. Uh, Nerfly was able to show which vessels were working as well as uh, where the vessels were located, providing guidance for manual lymph drainage. And Dr. Eric Mouse at Memorial Hermann Hospital here in Houston collaborated with us on this and, and other studies. And my colleague um, who has moved to uh, another institution, Itchy Chan, he uh, spearheaded this, this, uh, this study. Uh, Dr. Ron Carney, who is a UT Health otolaryngologist, has been collaborating with our team to use Nerfly to detail LA development in head and neck cancer survivors, um, an astonishing 85% of whom will develop some combination of symptoms such as difficulty swallowing, vision problems, and ear or nasal complications, as reported by Sheila Redners and other groups. We found that lymphatic flow through the neck is impaired when lymph sets in. Um, uh, resulting in something we call lymph backflow. And interestingly, this backflow was only noted on sides where both surgery and radiation had occurred. In collaboration with Dr. Thomas O'Donnell, the Tufts University vascular surgeon, Nerfly helped discern the contribution of lymphatics to leg swelling in a May Thurner syndrome patient. And that's not what is shown here. I'm, I'm just going to describe this. But May, May Thurner patients typically will present with left iliac vein occlusion, uh, which is sometimes associated with LE in the other leg. And, and the leg swelling due to May Thurner syndrome can also be mistaken for LE. Uh, venogram, together with Nerfly imaging, made a more complete picture of the blood vasculature and lymphatic interplay for this patient. In several other studies with Dr. O'Donnell, sluggish lymphatic pumping and backflow were found in patients with venous stasis ulcers, peripheral vascular disease, and chronic venous insufficiency. And here you can see our collaborator as well as a good example of tortuous vessels and, and, and backflow. Dr. Matthew Greaves, a UT Health pediatric plastic surgeon, has used Nerfly for insight into the case of, an unex of unexplained swelling in a toddler's arm. Um, while the patient's mother held the toddler in her lap, uh, and sometimes, yes, he was kicking a little and sometimes he was napping, Nerfly allowed visualization of the arm and leg lymphatics. Uh, lymphatic pumping was evident in the three unswollen extremities, but absent in the swollen arm, although the, the vessels looked intact. Um, gentle massage stimulated lymph movement in that arm, suggesting that when patent lymphatic vessels are present 
MLD could perhaps be an effective treatment even in young children. Dr. Durasami Balagura, uh, a UT Health cardio a pediatric cardiologist, worked with us on a study to try to understand pathophysiology in chylothorax after neonatal and pediatric heart surgery. At the uh, bedside, Nerfly provided information as to the origin of pleural swelling in several critically ill babies and allowed the physicians to direct further treatment. Nerfly has been used to assess the effectiveness of, of manual lymph drainage or MLD to show whether or not MLD actually moves lymph, and I'm not showing this here, but Nerfly provided videos showing that indeed lymph moves in response to MLD, providing evidence to medical insurers of the usefulness of MLD for LE patients. And Nerfly has been used in several studies to determine if pneumatic compression therapy or PCT can move lymph. In the first study, which isn't, is not shown here, both LE patients and co healthy control subjects were imaged before and immediately after PCT using completely opaque garments. Uh, lymphatic function improved in all the control subjects and all asymptomatic arms of uh, the BCR uh, lymphedema or LA subjects. Moreover, lymphatic function improved in four of the six BCRL affected arms. In a, a more recent study, we used clear uh, PCT garments. You can see a uh, partially clear one here with windows as well as a completely clear one here. And you can see that uh, you can visualize healthy lymphatics, lymph linear lymphatics here, as well as backflow um, in, in, this, in this image here. So in this study, we wanted to allow real-time visualization of lymph pumping during PCT. And uh, we, we, we saw four different types of LE um, with four different study subjects, including a combination LE lipedema case. And in all four cases, movement of lymph was noted in response to PCT. And a special note was the fact that in an early LE subject, and I'll show you in the next slide here with movies, um, with still patent um, uh, vessels uh, that this left uh, movie here is before, and, and in all three movies you're actually seeing the same uh, vessels. This is at a slightly different angle. It's just the way we had the camera turned during the PCT. But this first movie is before, this is during, and the one on the right is after, 30 minutes after uh, pneumatic compression therapy. And you can see we were able to put numbers to the, to the images, and there were statistically significant improvements in pulsing during and after the uh, PCT. I previously mentioned some mice carrying muta uh, genetic mutations that mimic those seen in humans with lymphatic aberrations. And the Nerfly systems with, uh, uh, have allowed us to validate and expand on what we see in many human studies of lymphatics. And my colleague, Sunkook Kwan, has investigated what happens to lymphatics in animal models of uh, hypertension, induced by a high salt diet, uh, lymph node removal, uh, inflammatory breast cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, um, and cancer metastasis. You can see some of the papers listed here. And um, I have used our animal nerfly systems to conduct a study showing that inflammatory cytokines can arrest the lymph pump through a, a nitric oxygen uh, mechanism. And here you'll see some movies, videos. The one on the left is a normal mouse lying on um, its side, and this is a, a inguinal lymph node, and you can see pul lymph pulsing at regular intervals up to the, the axillary lymph node basin. And here on the, on the other side, you'll see that um, a mouse that's uh, been treated with inflammatory cytokines uh, does not pulse lymph, and the, the vessel actually looks to be dilated. Um, we um, actually even saw some reversal of lymph pumping, which might be uh, due to uh, dilated vessels in which the valve ends don't touch, um, kind of like stretched open floodgates. And here you can see uh, a mouse lying on his side and, and the um, lymph goes in the direction it should, which is up, and then it'll come back down. We've seen this in some human studies uh, and human subjects as well. So in the future, Nerfly could be used to image uh, fluorescently labeled markers of metastatic tumor cells and lymph nodes, inflammatory cells, and diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and even lymphatic drainage of the brain. And to date, much work has been done by other groups using 
lab bench techniques, microscopy, genetic engineering, and other uh, tools to reveal the structure and workings of the lymphatic system. And many clinical quality of life studies have provided information on LA's impact on pat patient lives and sometimes maybe even given hints as to the cause or etiology of LA after cancer. My colleagues and I have enjoyed being able to contribute to the understanding of lymphatics and health and disease. Um, Nerdly has allowed insight into how lymphatics pump and how lymphatic dysfunction manifests, how LA can be treated, and, and where our LA research can go. And I've, I've um, my immediate colleagues are, are pictured here um, Eva Sebek Maraca and John Rasmussen, Sunkook Kwan, Bangay Zhu, and John Rodney Murrow are, are all part of our human clinical uh, and, and animal clinical imaging teams. Um, I have mentioned a lot of other colleagues and collaborators throughout the talk, but the biggest thanks goes to the hundreds of volunteers who have given their time and, and traveled sometimes from very great distances to allow us to see what their lymphatics look like, and, and I thank you. I'll take questions now, and there may be a slight lag before these come in. I'll wait for them to, uh, to come on in. Okay, the first question I would uh, like to address is actually whether we have uh, here we go. Whether or not a study subject's uh, inf inflammation can affect the um, pulsing. And I think the answer to this is uh, yes. And we actually have an example of this. So I just showed you mice that are, um, let's see if it'll go back. Yeah, here we go. So we have mice that don't pulse when they have inflammatory cytokines injected in them. But the impetus for these, these uh, experiments actually came from a control study subject who came in to be imaged. And he actually had an, infected, an infection on his foot. And he, um, we had two cameras, one on his affected foot and one on the unaffected foot. And he did, not have, he did not have LA. And I stood there with the camera and noticed for over an hour that his, his lymph really wasn't pulsing and his vessels looked dilated. So the answer is yes, probably when uh, there's a state of inflammation, the lymph pulsing slows down perhaps due to inflammatory cytokines or other factors. How long does it take to image a study subject? Here we go. The um, typical time we take for a, a, a session, we'll call it that, is, is about, total is about three to four hours and that includes the, a period of time at the beginning where we obtain informed consent or we, we do the informed consent process and then uh, get, get things ready. The actual imaging only lasts one to two hours and some of the studies looking at pneumatic compression therapy we image for anywhere from 30 minutes uh, to an hour then the, the PCT treatment takes anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour and then we image again after that. So um, anywhere from three to four hours is a typical study, study session. Here we go. Uh, here's a question. Do you foresee ICG being used to diagnose LE? Yes, I do. LE uh, detection at the earliest stages has been, we, we hear this preached over and over, the earlier you catch it, the better. And we'll hopefully see with the uh, study that Simona Shadelman and I will be doing, we're hoping we'll catch some early LE that we'll be able to see uh, like uh, lymph collecting in pools or stagnant lymph before they'll actually will actually be able to detect swelling. So we're hoping that the parameter will confirm what later what we see with uh, nerfly imaging earlier on. Is there a time frame that this imaging will be available commercially or offered within uh, medical uh, treatment? I wish I had a great answer for that. I know as I speak my colleague is in the engineering lab building another system for another study. Um, I believe that um, my, my, uh, my colleagues, Eva and John, could answer the question better than I could, but yes, I would, I would suspect fairly soon we'll see it. We've enjoyed using it for a lot of uh, research applications, as you can see. It's been fun. Oh, here's one. Uh, I, I wanted to know how probable it is that Ellie might have some genetic impact on my child. Is it hereditary? I'm a female from India with primary LE. Wow, I wish I knew the answer to this question. Um, yes, pro there's a possibility. If it's not, you know, of course, a, a 
you know, if it's not, um, if it's a, uh, there's so many different types of uh, mutations that have been shown to cause or to be associated with LE, you know, VEGFR3 mutations and uh, others have been shown to affect up to like a third of the known primary LE cases, but for the others, we don't really know what they are. And as I've shown in this presentation, we chipped away at a few more, but I think there will be more and more discovered and there may be multifactorial uh, 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 cases as well, where you have, have more than one gene mutated to cause LE. That's a, that's a great question, we just don't know. Here's a question, where or which hospital or clinic will have this testing? Well, it's not available yet, but uh, currently we're uh, using it at, uh, um, in hospitals around the Houston area. We are closely affiliated with Memorial Hermann and MD Anderson here, and we actually have been up at St. Luke's in the Woodlands and some other places as well. Okay, here's another question. Does this study verify that lymph proteins do move into the lymphatics while using um, IPC or MLD? And I'd say yes. Um, we simply wouldn't be seeing free dye with our imaging system. The free dye would leach out, would be uh, probably, we won't see it. We would, only things we're seeing are uh, ICG bound to protein. So the answer to that is yes. Here's another question. What precautions must I take for my child? I have a boy. Well, you want to just alert your physician that you're concerned and talk to your physician. We, I certainly wouldn't give you any medical advice. Um, there are a number of wonderful uh, LE therapists and physicians available. I don't know about India. I have been to meetings where we've had people, where people from India have come in to present. So there is, um, there are some resources there. And I would say uh, contact LEARN. They, they, will, they will help you. Oh, I see. Here we go. What symptoms must I look for? I am worried for him. Also, is it true that it affects females more than males? I don't, I don't think that it affects females uh, more than males necessarily in the primary cases. Uh, um, and certainly cancer treatment affected, it just depends on the type of cancer as to what percentage will, will more likely become uh, lymphedemic. I, I would again refer you to a physician and uh, LEARN can help you uh, find someone for that possibly. Uh, here's one. How will this imaging affect treatment in primary LE? We've seen a number of primary LE study subjects and it's, it's not like there's a, a, a standard uh, phenotype. Some of the subjects seem to have LE you know, like a, a patch of stagnant lymph at their ankles and nowhere else. Sometimes it's up at the thigh uh, or a certain portion of their arm. It might be helpful to um, to kind of localize the, the areas where lymph is most stagnant. I don't know that we've actually started to uh, try to classify the phenotypes. I know a group in Japan has, but we, we haven't actually seen a progression of, of the phenotypes that they see in the same order although their, their studies are, are beautiful. So I don't really have a good answer for that. <laughs> um, how will this, okay, the, how will it affect treatment in primary? It might direct uh, therapists, MLD therapists, to um, find which vessels actually work. So maybe the, the MLD could be more effective. Might help with uh, deciding which uh, type of compression bandage to use. Um, but that's really, a, that would be up to your therapist. Okay, here's a question. Have you noticed differences between types of mild and intensity, oh, oh MLD, excuse me, and intensity of lymph pumping? No, we haven't. And we haven't tried different pressures um, of uh, PCT on uh, subjects. That's a kind of a hot topic, I think, up more over in Europe than here. So the, the, the answer to that question, Ethan, is, is no, we, we, haven't, uh, we haven't done that. That would be a fun study to do. Oh, Betty uh, Smoot, thank you. Here we go. Betty Smoot asks, uh, thanks for the excellent talk, thank you. Will your longitudinal study or cancer-related LE include pre-op assessments? Yes. We're not gonna catch them before neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but we will catch them before surgery. And I'm just in, intensely um, <laughs> curious as to what uh, we'll see even just after surgery, how the lymphatics will heal themselves or we are anastomose to other vessels. So we're, we're really looking forward to that study. We're about to start it next week, uh, the actual uh, recruitment. So um, it should be very, very interesting. So yes, we will catch the pre-op and the, our parameter readings that will be done along the way as well.
Thank you. Well, I want to thank everyone for your attention. And uh, again, I'll uh, uh, reiterate that LEARN will make these uh, webinars available later. So if you miss them or you want to replay them, um, check with LEARN. And I really appreciate the opportunity to get to talk about what I do. It's very uh, exciting for me to get to do it. And I have a great group of colleagues and uh, the support we get from groups like Earn, Learn is, has been great. So thank you.